Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Romania. Hello, Fisher, especially. Um, I remember with such affection uh, the many Fisher conferences that I've had the pleasure to participate in uh, personally in the days when we had conferences where people were together and drank coffee together and worked in rooms together. What a wonderful time that was. And it seems like another age now, I think, doesn't it? Um, so now look, uh, quite a few of the speakers yesterday and today, well, there hasn't been that much of today yet, um, will be speaking about the online world. Um, and I'm going to speak about the online world as well, but in a different way, perhaps because I want to cast my net a little bit wider and reflect uh, on the strange world we've been living in since uh, February, March this year, and which is still going on in its own way with all its reverberations around the world. Uh, and, and I think I'd better start with, with some rather grim statistics on a kind of world basis. My country, for example, um, 60,000 people dead with this from this pandemic. Um, constant confusion about what people are supposed to be doing uh, and, and what whether you could stay inside or go out or who you can be with or what you can do. We have chaos this morning because the four countries of the United Kingdom, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland disagree about things. And so we have uh, chaos going on. Um, and it's been like this for months. You know this, you all know this. There's nothing special in what I'm telling you. At the same time, uh, the, the pandemic and lockdown has presented in extraordinary examples of phenomenal creativity on the part of artists and musicians and writers and carers uh, and and teachers especially uh, just to look around at some of the things people have been doing and the ways that the teaching community and the ELT the English language teaching community has responded to uh, to lockdown and the situation we live in has been inspiring uh, I've just been uh, to use that that silly old cliche, I've just been blown away by some of the creativity that people uh, have shown um, in our profession, and I'm proud to be a member of this profession. Um, but I was very taken with an issue uh, of the magazine Modern English Teacher recently. Uh, there are a number of articles there about how people have responded to to lockdown and the online world and so on and so forth, uh, and I. Uh, um, by the way, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm trying to read the comments uh, as, as I speak, but I'm not doing very well because I can't do two things at once. I'm a man, come on, multitasking, forget it. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, but one article in particular uh, attracted my attention. It, it was by a woman called um, uh, uh, Caroline Knight. Uh, and now, now you can see it, that on the screen. Uh, and her story it, it just impressed me. She works in a school in Galicia, in, in northern Spain, northwest Spain, and their school faced the prospect of, of going bankrupt, uh, of, of having to close because students stopped coming. Um, uh, and they, she and her director of studies and the various other people, uh, they, they worked through this and they found a way to make it happen. They found a way of accessing their online students. Of, and basically they, they, they stopped the school from closing by working immensely hard uh, and, and with great imagination uh, and to see how it would work. Um, and this paragraph uh, particularly caught my eye. Uh, and you can read it for yourselves. Uh, this is, by the way, this is, she's writing now, um, she, they've done it. They've stopped the school from going under. They've stopped the school from going bankrupt. Things aren't perfect, but, but they're okay. And then she writes this paragraph.
and I just thought it was it. it, it I, I just I just find this paragraph very very uh, um, uh, moving and impressive because they did do an amazing job and and uh, uh, they managed to stave off bankruptcy. They've 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 still they can employ the whole team, but look around and all the other schools that are closing. Look around at the terrible uh, uh, tragedy to many people's lives um, that those of us who, who survived so far are okay with. And that's the context where this talk has to happen. Uh, um, it's just a difficult world and it's difficult for everyone and all of our families. And I hope to God that none of your families or your relations or your friends or anything else like that have been affected by this. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so far, touch wood, um, you know, I'm I'm OK. Uh, and I, you know, when I say I, I mean, I, my family, my grandchildren, my, you know, all the, the my daughter, we're OK so far. I, mean, I hate, to, hate to go on with that. There you are. So I just want to say that, that, that that's the context in which we speak. And of course, you know that perfectly well. Um, now. Uh, but let's let's get going. Let's let's start this conversation. Um, and I want to tell you a story. Uh, this story uh, is about a woman called Grace Mulford. Uh, and she lives most of the time in Manchester in the United Kingdom, but she's originally from Pennsylvania. And um, in 2015, she was visiting, I guess, uh, relations in Pennsylvania in the United States. And she sat down to watch the television. And what she saw was uh, President uh, Barack Obama, and he went to a place called Charleston in South Carolina. Now, in case the name doesn't mean anything to you, uh, Charleston was where some crazy uh, idiot with a, with a gun walked into a, a, a church um, of worshippers, people of color, and he shot nine of them uh, for some stupid uh, well it doesn't even matter what an what an idiot and um uh, worse than an idiot but that anyway and so they had a big a big uh um event to to eulogize the, the victims of this terrible terrible atrocity and the president went so different from the man who occupies that job now and he went and he stood there and you can watch the video. It's an incredibly moving video of what she, what Grace Mulford saw on the television. And, and uh, he's standing there and you can see him trying to think of what to say. What do you, what do you say? What do you say? And he didn't say anything. Not at first. He did something quite extraordinary. He sang. He sang a song. And Grace Mulford was so impressed that she wrote uh, that she wrote a song about what she saw on the television. And with your permission, well, even without it, I'm going to sing it to you. And you've got the words for it. So this is the song that Grace Mulford wrote. <laughs> Whoops, like, that's a bit silly. There we are, that's better. A young man came to a church, a house of prayer, and they did not ask what brought him there. He was not friend and he was not kin, but they opened the door and they let him in. And for an hour, the stranger stayed, and he sat with them, and he seemed to pray. And then that young man got a gun, and he shot nine people, the old and the young.
Charleston in the month of June. The mourners gathered in the room and the president came to say some words and the cameras rolled and the nation heard. But no words could say what must be said about all the living and about the dead. And so on that day, and in that place, the president sang amazing grace. The president sang amazing grace. We argued about where to lay the blame on one man's hate or a nation's shame, some sickness of the mind or soul, and how the words might be made whole, how the wounds might be made whole. But no words could say what must be said about all the living and about the dead, and so on that day, and in that place, the president sang amazing grace. The president sang amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a poor wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Well, it's not uh, every day that a talk about English language teaching starts with a song like that. But there's a reason for it. I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I think of that story and that song. Uh, I think, um, uh, and by the way, if you want to see a wonderful cartoon of it, you can see uh, there's a YouTube uh, video of it, and you'll hear Grace Mulford singing it, and and um, see a wonderful animation to do with the event. But I think that what the last president of the United States did on that day, uh, and this is not a judgment about his his record, his politics, his, his, this is, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about what this man did. I think he showed leadership, uh, and crucially, and this is the word I'm going to come back to again and again and again, he demonstrated empathy. The ability, as uh, Michelle Obama said in the recent Democratic Convention, online Democratic Convention, the ability to walk in someone else's shoes. And yes, amazing grace, he showed grace. And these are qualities I'm going to talk about in, in yes, uh, I've just seen, uh, Claudia, you're talking about the quality of a man, yes, of, of a person, of a human being. That's exactly what I'm talking about. But when you are thrust into a leadership role, it, it, it's a, an incredible exposure of whether you have those qualities. Uh, and, he, and he had those qualities on that day, it seems to me. Uh, and and yes, I'm going to talk politics for a little bit, 
but not politics of left or right or policies, but politics of leadership. Because if you look around the world we're living in at the moment, um, we have a clear demonstration of what leadership looks like and doesn't look like. Uh, so for example, I, I offer you, on one hand, I offer you uh, people like Angela Merkel in Germany, uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, uh, Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland. And these are all people, women, coincidence? I don't know. Uh, and I'm not going into that territory. These are all uh, 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 le leaders who have shown a kind of maturity and a responsibility and a grace and an empathy for the people they have been chosen to, to lead. Uh, and in, on the subject of Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, uh, her response, for example, to a similar massacre, uh, a repulsive massacre in New Zealand uh, a year ago, a year or so ago, was precisely unbelievably empathetic. And I will show you on the other side, a different kind of leadership, and that is demonstrated by people like the Prime Minister of my country, Boris Johnson, uh, by uh, Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, by Donald Trump in America, where empathy and grace seem the qualities most uh, uh, lacking. And uh, mm -hmm. that interests me very much because I see a strong correlation between uh, what happens when you get chosen to be the leader of something, uh, a country, a group, uh, a committee, a school, whatever you like, and what happens when you are in a, the teacher's role in, in, in the classroom, where essentially those qualities of leadership need to be present when we work with a group of students, whether it's our age or little kids or teenagers or, or whoever you're working with, or if you're training teachers, in a sense, you occupy some kind of a leadership role. Now, how you, how you, how you uh, um, show that leadership is, of course, um, one of the main stays of teacher training. We speak about it a lot. Um, but what I think the, the, the pandemic has, has, has uh, demonstrated about our world leaders, our country leaders, is some wonderful dichotomies. So, for example, uh, the the difference between the ability to show empathy and the absence of empathy. Uh, it's so starkly um, uh, evident if you look at the way different leaders have done this. Uh, the difference between grace, which, which uh, Barack Obama showed on that day and frequently in his presidency, and vulgarity. Uh, uh, no names, but I'm sure you would you would you would uh, uh, understand who I'm talking about. Uh, the difference between instilling confidence and inciting despair. Uh, by the way, uh, um, that's something that's happening in front of our eyes uh, in the United States at the moment with the whole Black Lives Movement um, protests uh, and whether the people who are called upon to lead the country can can um, instill confidence or just make people more desperate. Uh, and and whether or not, uh, whether or not, however genuine you are or not, doesn't seem to matter. It's the face validity that matters. Can people believe in you as a leader? Uh, the difference between flat out lying and telling the truth. Uh, I look at uh, uh, some of the, uh, the people I mentioned, like, like Nic Nicola Sturgeon and, and Jacinda Ardern, and they tell the truth. Uh, not always good. They make mistakes. Of course they make mistakes. We'll make mistakes, for God's sake. They tell the truth. Uh, the difference between careful thought with the help of expert knowledge versus thoughtless prejudice. And, and, and grandstanding, sacking experts, doing all that kind of thing. Uh, the difference between uh, 
directness, honesty, and humility with kind of hiding behind things in vain glory and so on. And above all, uh, the overwhelming importance of treating people with respect. Uh, because because I'm I'm British and and obviously I'm focused on uh, not just on the world but on a lot of stuff that happens in my country. I wanted to quote this little exchange uh, <coughs> a few weeks ago between um, uh, the Prime Minister of this country, Boris Johnson, and the leader of the opposition. <coughs> Keir Starmer, but that's not a COVID cough, by the way. Uh, between uh, and Keir Starmer, who's the leader of the opposition. So uh, Keir Starmer was standing up in the House of Commons, our parliamentary chamber, and he was um, questioning, <coughs> que questioning the government's handling of the pandemic. He was asking him challenging questions. He was asking him difficult questions because our government's response has been confusing and it's been it's been difficult. Uh, and Johnson, <coughs> so, so sorry, <coughs> he said, "You're undermining confidence because you criticise track and trace, which is this hopeless scheme that that we were told by our prime minister was world class, but isn't." And it's it's Keir Starmer's reply that interests me. He said it's perfectly possible to support track and trace and point out the problems. And standing up every week saying it's a stunning success is kidding no one. That's what Boris Johnson did. It's fantastic. <coughs> that isn't giving people confidence in the system. They, the people, would like a prime minister who stands up and says there are problems and this is what I'm going to do about them. Uh, uh, and I've just seen a comment which said it's been hard for all governments around the world. There's no perfect answer to such a global emergency. And I could not agree more. I think almost every single person on the planet is just so grateful that they're not the prime minister or the president, because it, this is just such a difficult situation to be in. <coughs> so, so um, uh, Raluca, Iona, I completely agree with what you've just what you've just typed. But my point is not whether they, the governments of the world have got it right or wrong. Dear God, I'm not a, a, a epidemiologist. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. My point is to say, but the people we rely on to help us through this, it's the way they behave in the face of this confusion and difficulty and not really knowing what the hell is going on and how to work with it. It's the way they behave that really affects us. Uh, so um, let's, let's, uh, let's move away from politics. I'm sure you'll be relieved about that. Um, uh, yes, uh, and, and uh, um, someone just wrote it. Yeah, uh, Daniela Nisto, it has. It's been hard for all of us. Of course it has. Um, so let, let, let's move away from, from the leaders of the world and everything else like that and talk instead about my contention which is that that kind of leadership and the leadership that teaching uh, asks of us are not entirely dissimilar i think i think uh, we we ask for some of the same qualities from our teachers as we do from our leaders and what are they well the greatest of all of them uh, like faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of all of them seems to me that word empathy. The ability to stand in someone else's shoes. Uh, the ability to stand in our students' shoes. Uh, the ability to try and see the world from their point of view. Uh, I don't. I don't say it's easy. Um, looking at me you can tell that it's quite a long time since I was a teenager and yes I remember about being a teenager uh, ish <laughs> not very well uh, but if you're teaching a bunch of teenagers uh, it, it somehow trying to see the world through their eyes not to say that 
what everything they do is right not to say that that they're sort of perfect or anything else like that but just trying to see what they're going through and how it is for them is one of the great qualities of what makes a good teacher it seems to me um the second quality which seems to me to be absolutely the same uh, for country leaders and teachers is is basically knowing what you're talking about uh being knowledgeable I, I can't speak being knowledgeable about what we do doing our best to stay uh alert to what people are saying about how teaching works and how learning works being curious about the world around us never stopping uh learning uh from 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 the unbelievable richness that that uh that so many experts around the world can give us and so many teachers pass on such amazing insights into what happens in their classrooms and so on being expert matters i was always very very um i i, I was always very taken with a conversation i had at the an IATEFL conference in the uk the international association of teachers of english as a foreign language that most of you are familiar with and I was talking to a Chinese student, a uh, Chinese teacher, I should say. Um, uh, uh, I must come back to, to, to Paula, Paula's comment, who says, I think you are born with empathy. We'll have to come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, um, and this Chinese teacher, we were discussing rapport. It's the kind of thing you discuss at a coffee break in, in Aotearoa. And I was saying the usual things about rapport, respect for students and and eye contact and all those kind of things. And she was saying, actually, what rapport means for us is, is when we think our teacher is knowledgeable. That's what creates the good rapport. And I know what she means. Um, are you, uh, so, so knowing what you're talking about matters, it seems to me. And, and we have a responsibility to keep trying to know what we're talking about. Uh, brackets, are we born with empathy? I think it's something you can learn. I think it's, no, 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 no. It's not something you can learn. I think it's something you can develop. I think it's something that our trainers in the world of teacher training can help us to develop, can, can give us techniques. Uh, techniques, that's the wrong word, but, but can help us to try and see things through, through uh, students' eyes, through reflection, through reflection on our own past, our own learning experiences and so on and so forth. Um, the third, the third quality that I think uh, teachers uh, need to take from from what I've said about leadership is something that that I think Michael Breen and Chris Candlin talked about years and years and years ago, which is about authenticity, about being authentic in the classroom. Now, I, I've got to get this right. Of course, when you walk into a classroom, you don't just behave like you behave. Uh, in my in my flat my office for example i'm different here than i am in a class uh, but i have to but you've got to take authenticity into the classroom be true be real don't be a liar uh, that's too strong a word uh, you know but be real um i think a quality that really impresses me about some of the better world leaders uh, which i'm sure teachers need to demonstrate apart from their creativity, their humor, their, their um, vitality, their vibrancy, but also to show students evidence of careful thought, that teachers are really thinking carefully about what's going on. Uh, absolutely classic uh, um, teacher quality that I would expect from my leaders and my teachers is the whole concept of even-handedness of teach, treating everyone the same uh, and recognizing, you know, that no one is more or less. Uh, and in, in this whole pandemic, that's been a, an essential quality for some leaders. And lastly, uh, um, uh, and this is one that really, really has come home to me through watching uh, our leaders trying to work out what the hell to do in this ridiculous situation we're in. The absolute classic is humility. Uh, the ability to be able to say, I don't know. Uh, we're doing our best. Uh, this is what I think. 
this is how we're going to try and resolve this. So that when the leader of the opposition in Britain says they would like a prime minister who stands up and says there are problems and this is what I'm going to do to try and solve them. That's the kind of leader, that's the kind of teacher uh, uh, that, that I want to have. So in other words, and I'm sure you do this as well, it, 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 I can't stop, it's terrible, it's like an illness. You watch people behave in the world and you kind of automatically uh, um, uh, connect it with what you think about teaching. And you sort of, you see a, a president of the United States and you think, well, would he be a good teacher in the classroom? Yeah, not sure, no, <laughs> uh, or yes, maybe. Anyway, so those are some comments about uh, what, uh, lockdown has taught me about what leadership is all about. Uh, yes, uh, and, and Adriana there says the courage to be vulnerable and show it. I think so. I don't think any students, students will mind if the teacher always doesn't know what they're talking about, because those two things are slightly in conflict. You have to know what you're talking about as much as you can. But when, but you know, the classic one is teacher, teacher, what's the difference between uh, I, I think I even gave a talk about this once at the Fisher Conference in, in Bucharest. What's the difference between um, costly and expensive, for example? Classic question. Uh, this, we've moved from leadership in a pandemic down to something tiny and small. What's the difference between costly and expensive, says a student? And I don't know about you, but do you know what? I don't really know. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's, I've never used one when I should use the other in my life. But if you ask me to explain the difference, I don't really know how to do that. Well, I do now because I've looked it up. And, and some teachers find it very difficult to say, I don't know, I'll find out. And yet, and yet students will instantly understand if you say, look, you know, vocabulary, that kind of vocabulary difference is really complex. And I could give you an answer right now, but it'd be much better for me to research it and make sure, for example. Um, there you go. Right, so those are some things about, about uh, leadership and teaching. Now, I want to go back to that song that I sang you, The President Sang Amazing Grace, which to my mind is, is almost um, a, a, a perfect song because it, it's so powerful and says so much in such a short space of time. Uh, I absolutely uh, love it as a song. <coughs> I wanted to tell you how I uh, came across that song, because it's part of what I want to talk about. So uh, in, in March, um, I re last March, I returned to the UK after um, two and a half months um, uh, of living in Brazil for reasons which are not important <coughs> to this um, this talk and I came back and one of the things I, I hadn't been able to do in Brazil is indulge in my my passions outside English language teaching <coughs> my passions I must go and get some water but but um, I won't for a moment because that means I have to leave the screen um, which is that as you obviously gather I play music uh, a lot of the time and you know everyone's got well, not everyone, but we've all got hobbies and obsessions and some people play football and some people play music and some people play chess or whatever. I play music. And so <coughs> I, I play in an orchestra and we rehearse every week uh, and then we do concerts and I go to lots of folk clubs and sing with a guitar or this this uh, this harmonium or whatever. And, and that's what I do. Um, and... Um, and sometimes I'll spend three or four nights a week uh, with other people playing music. Well, uh, or rather I used to. So I came back from Brazil where I hadn't been able to play any live music uh, for two and a half months. And I was desperate to see my friends, to play music together in the orchestra, to play, sing with a guitar in a folk club. I was so excited to do it. And of course, just as I arrived back in the UK, uh, two things happened. The first is that... Um, my third grandchild was born, so that was hooray! And and then the second thing was was I got a, a um, I got a, I got a message. I was about to go and play in a folk club somewhere fairly near Cambridge in the United Kingdom where I live, but I got a message. I was sitting at my breakfast table having a cup of coffee one morning, and I got a message from the organisers saying, 
it's it's uh, cancelled because of because of we're about to do go into lockdown, and uh, and I was uh, super uh, depressed about this because I've been so excited for nearly three months to to go back to live music, and so half an hour later. Um, by the way, you may be able to hear there's someone working in the garden of these flats, and they've got a got something making a, a, a I don't know what is a trimmer or something. I hope I hope you can't hear it too much. Uh, anyway, so uh, by the way, uh, uh, Mallow says creativity is the most important skill of leadership. Yes, but mix mix creativity in with all the other things we were talking about. I think. Sorry, back to my story. So I was sitting at the breakfast table, so upset that the, this live event where people sing to each other in the same room uh, had been cancelled that the um i got in touch with the organizer half an hour later i said look um i've used the zoom platform in meetings with editors and publishers and things like that um shall we try that uh with with musicians shall we try that and and he thought about it. he said okay let's give it a try and then we spent two or three days messing around and uh, <coughs> um, um, you can do all sorts of things with Zoom. We're using Adobe here, but you can do all sorts of things with Zoom to change the settings so that music sounds good because Adobe essentially is a speech. Uh, it's, it's the, the algorithms are focused on, on speech, but you can change it so many, blah, blah, blah. So we spent a couple of days experimenting and then with great, with great um, uh, fear, I started the first ever uh, uh, lockdown, we call it lockdown folk. Um, and tomorrow we'll be doing the 48th one of these lockdown folk things. And they are absolutely incredible. And I'm going to talk about them quite a lot. Because just as I talked about uh, um, uh, world leaders to lead us on to teaching, I'm going to talk about this lockdown folk to lead us into uh, qualities for online teaching. Uh, uh, that I think are absolutely vital. So I started this lockdown folk uh, and people now come from all over the world. We have people from the United States, from Denmark, from from uh, from um, Hungary, from Italy, from Scotland and Wales and up and down and everywhere um, uh, and, and England and so on and so forth. And And it's just the most emotionally powerful thing you know. And one evening, uh, well, two things happen. A particular singer who comes, uh, who's, who's Belgian, as it happens, a woman called Anne. Um, I saw her playing an instrument uh, which is very like this one, uh, um, very like like this this one I was playing before, um, and that encouraged me to to buy this instrument. And I've never used, um, uh, I'd never played one of these things before, um, and I love it. Uh, but also. Um, she told me or she told us or something about this song the president sang amazing grace and that le led me to the song and an instant instant i don't know but i was just completely moved emotionally by the song the first time i heard it and had to had to learn it so i came to it uh um because of this connection we have on zoom uh um uh, yes, uh, Amelia, em empathy is the name of the game, because what happens in this lockdown, folk, is that, uh, well, uh, let me tell you why it's so good. Uh, in the first place, this was a community of mostly strangers. A few of us knew each other before we started, uh, but rather like a class, uh, it was a community of, essentially of strangers. There were people there who played things you squeeze and guitars and things you blow and things you play and singers and all sorts of people. But that was the thing which bound us together. But mostly these were people, in my case, I'd never met before. We've now become, uh, and yes, uh, Alina, I think that's perfectly expressed, being alone together. We've now become a community much more than a community close friends close online friends uh, but we talk of the day when we will organize the first ever lockdown folk live weekend and we will all be able to get together 
And we talk about that. It's this great dream we have, like some kind of <coughs> mythic future we're all invested in. The second thing that interested me about that, that this uh, uh, was, was that at the beginning, and even now, uh, <coughs> we had to learn how to use Zoom, how to play music on Zoom and what would happen. People got it wrong. People, you, they didn't turn on this or they didn't turn off that or they, or, or they, they tried to use too many fancy microphones or, or, they, or, they, or they got too close or they, you couldn't see them. You know, some people, some people are sort of a bit like this and all you ever see is, is that, you know. And so there was lots of trial and error and getting it wrong and screwing up and not doing terribly well. But nobody minded. Everyone said, this is part of the deal. We're all doing something different, something new. Something that has absolutely, I'm going to use that dreadful expression again, blown my mind, is the quality of, of, of well, uh, in conversation with, with uh, 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 Mark Andrews, who was here earlier, and Ken Wilson, who is one of the speakers uh, at this conference, and, and a couple of other people. We were trying to work out what it was that made this kind of interaction uh, so powerful. And, and we came up with about uh, four qualities. Let me explain. So you're sitting there, uh, and on your screen are 25, 30, 35 people in their little boxes on the screen. And then I say to uh, to one of them, I say, um, uh, Andy, would you like to sing us a song? I, I, I wonder what you're going to sing, what kind of a song it's going to be. And Andy, who's the wonderful singer, and he's a fantastic guitarist, he plays a song. And even though all I'm looking at are faces on the screen, you can tell, and everybody mutes their microphones, because otherwise you get feedback and all sorts of stuff, uh, while he's playing. But this is what this is what you get. You get incredible presence. Everybody is present. How do I know that? You know that because if you look at the faces, they're all looking at the screens. They're present in a way that sometimes we feel students are in a classroom. There is, of course, a silence uh, um, because we've all muted our microphones. But it's a really powerful silence because it's a listening silence. It's absolutely a listening silence because... People are silent and they're listening and focusing on what's going on. There's an incredible intimacy about it. Why? Maybe because we're all because we're all sitting in our offices or our bedrooms or our, we'll come to the bedrooms thing in a minute. But but not that that's not as exciting as it sounds. Um, uh, the, the, we're all in our private space, and it's just us. There aren't five, ten people sitting around us so that we're conscious of our behavior. We're all, it, it's intimate, it's me listening to you. Uh, uh, and most of all is the attention uh, that people give to each other. So, so there's a guy called, um, oh heavens, I've just seen the time. Uh, I, must, I must hurry on. Uh, okay, um, one of the things that happens uh, uh, in these lockdown folk sessions um, is, is that uh, we have pre-session chats. We get together, we chat. We chat for 20 minutes or so uh, sometimes before, uh, before the session starts. And that chat is terribly important. We, there's incredible empathy on display. Uh, you've got the chat box here, like we have a chat box and chat blocks, chat box. People talk to each other. They exchange messages. Something happens. Some incredible support, some empathetic support is there present all the time. And there's humour and private messaging. And then outside the sessions, outside the sessions, oh, there, Mark, you're there. Um, yes, uh, um, how nice to see you, Mark. And um, um, uh, the the and Mark, by the way, has come to Lockdown Folk, and he's a fantastic singer and raconteur. And if you ever get a chance to get him to sing to you or or, or tell stories of, of of his time, especially in in Central Europe and 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 so on. Please do, because you won't reg regress a single minute of it. Um, but uh, but um, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's all the contacts we have outside the sessions. Um, and inside the sessions, there's a tremendous 
support for everyone. Um, and people do what, what folk musicians often do. They forget words or they get the tune wrong or something like that, or they screw up. I've never heard a word of criticism, just support. Uh, it's, um, and the other thing to say is that every session is completely different. And you never know whether you're gonna get a, a French accordion tune or someone, uh, we've, we've just been joined by a new guy, um, by, oh, forget my phone, uh, by a new guy who, who does all sorts of totally weird things and it's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> so there we are. So that's my story about lockdown folk. Uh, let's quickly translate that um, uh, to teaching online. Um, uh, and let's try and pick up some of the points I've just made. Number one, in an online environment, especially an online environment where many teachers and students were thrown into it suddenly. Some people, of course, had been doing it uh, um, already, but a lot of teachers uh, um, uh, suddenly had to start converting all of their face-to-face -face teaching into online. Um, 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 uh, oh, stop it. People keep bringing me up. Um, they'll go away in a minute. Oh, I can, wait a minute, I can stop it. Uh, they've gone. Um, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yes. What was I talking about? Completely lost my thread. Um, oh, yes, I know what I was talking about. <laughs> I know what I was talking about. Um, uh, in the first place, you know, trial and error is fine. Trial and error is always fine. And when you're working in an online environment, you screw up all the time. Students screw up and teachers screw up and they press the wrong buttons and things don't work and the Wi-Fi stops working and things like that. It's fine. It's only not fine when people panic, but it's fine if the community uh, accepts that. The second thing is that a community is really important. The community. Uh, and creating that community is one of the most vital tasks of any online uh, teacher or any classroom teacher, if you want. Um, so in the case of this lockdown folk I've been telling you about, we've spent a lot of time, uh, not through any grand design, but it's taught me a lot, actually making the community work, making people work with each other, empathize with each other, support each other, talking to them about their issues and so on and so forth. That's part of why it works. Um, and that's why, by the way, this opening chat is often uh, vital. Not everyone is there, but it just, by the time the opening chat is over uh, um, uh, and we start singing, there's an atmosphere. How can, I, how can I describe this when it's just a screen? There's an atmosphere of warmth and empathy and support which is quite extraordinary. Um, and, and yes, uh, um, uh, really, really amazing. And, um, and I've, I've mentioned before, I talked before uh, about um, this incredible attention and presence and silence. Uh, and that's really important. Um, uh, and uh, of course, I'm speaking idealistically. Uh, what we know about online teaching is one of the most difficult things is keeping students on task, uh, uh, continuing to uh, uh, involve them uh, and, and, and get them engaged, which is a big challenge. Um, uh, and, um, but the other thing is, is what I've found out, this is so true for online teaching as well, which is outside the class, outside the actual online session, staying in touch, getting in touch with parents, bringing them in, not to the class, but bringing them in to some of the issues surrounding it, supporting students and, and so on and, and so forth. And all of these things uh, um, uh, seem to me to be absolutely vitally important. And, and it fascinates me that something quite outside my teaching world, which is the world of folk singing and music demonstrates exactly the same issues um, as as online teaching does um, and if, if you like face-to-face -face teaching as well now look I'm not saying everything's easy before I mentioned um, you know people in their private spaces their offices their bedrooms all that kind of thing and and it's not particularly necessarily easy uh, um, to, to be that intimate and teachers and students have to be super careful obviously of that kind of, uh, of, of intimacy but, but as Aline has just said we, we have to adapt yes we do absolutely um, so 
Now, I, I wanted to just briefly um, uh, mention a, a few things, and then I'll come up with some concluding remarks. Um, there's, there's a, there's um, uh, in this, in the article in the same issue of Modern English Teacher, you've got uh, um, uh, Vijaya Kumar uh, and Shakui talking about. Um, they they say that one of the clues to online teaching is interaction first, input next. It's the interaction that matters. It's the way you connect, the way that community is fostered and worked with that matters so much more than, than going straight into um, how the third conditional is formed or something like that, uh, especially online. Not, not uniquely, but especially online. That kind of ability to interact on a human level, on an empathetic level, with grace, uh, and with what somebody earlier, I can't remember who said, said, uh, said, said um, uh, creativity and so on. That's the key to everything. And maybe it's the key to everything in English language teaching as well. Um, uh, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we, how do we interact? Well, each of us who's here is different. Each teacher has their own style, their different, own style of interaction and so on and so forth. Um, uh, the, 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 these, the, the proxemics authors, proxemics and pandemics, they talk a lot about, about key repetition and rewording, constantly repeating and rewording and so on. Um, uh, um, uh, Lucas Conker and Andrew Jarvis, uh, um, called keeping the, the, they talk about how we create, how we create a presence. The teacher has to create a presence, our screen face. I'm nervous about saying this because of course I'm, um, you, you can see me now and I shouldn't really be talking about um yes uh sorry I just saw Marilena saying when we work online four hours it seems like working eight I was going to say one of the huge disadvantages about online teaching is it's much more intense than than teaching face to face and and demands tremendous stamina on the part of teachers and that's a whole other issue too um okay uh well yeah so so Lucas and Andrew talk about creating presence with the screen face um, the, 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 you know spontaneity really matters online spontaneity really matters the only way you're going to keep it alive and intimate and contacting is to be able to react to the moment to react to what's going on and so on and so forth um, uh, absolutely key which is what Marilena's point I think uh, is, is is office hours uh, I've been teaching online for, for years and years and years uh, at the MA level, um, uh, as it happens. And the biggest problem there is, is the whole issue of 24-7 access and students expecting you to be there all the time. Uh, um, you need to be, uh, and particularly because of what Marilena said, you need to be absolutely clear about when you're there and when you're not, um, and so on. Um, they talk about scheduling emails, scheduling announcements, giving students some kind of uh, routine and rhythm in all this. Um, they talk about entry questions and exit questions and, and you know, having good startups and good exits because you always remember how something ends more than you remember how it begins. And that really matters. And so on and so forth. Uh, Leah Bert Bertaco, um, uh, she just, you've got those two quotes there uh, and, and, and empathy uh, is the key uh, and the fact is you know there was this man called Prensky in 2001 who came up with this ridiculous idea of digital natives and digital immigrants which was so stupid as if all kids born in the digital age become digital experts it's rubbish it's like all kids born with a piano in a house will become great pianists well it's not true some some kids are more uh, technically uh, um, uh, sophisticated than others. Now I've only got a few minutes, but uh, I've just got uh, got uh, three little examples, uh, uh, which I uh, just as a kind of uh, a lightning of what we've been talking about. Um, so I was reading an article in in the paper the other day. Uh, paper? Well, actually, I was reading an article on my phone, uh, uh, and and. Um, uh, and I read something called The Guardian, which just shows that I'm a sort of slightly left-wing liberal kind of person. Sorry, I, I admit. Uh, but anyway, they had a really good article about, about 
uh, recruitment in the business world during COVID and lockdown. Because when someone gets a new job and they go to the office for the first time, well, when they used to do that, uh, um, what happens? Well, you know, you get introduced to the secretary, you get introduced to these, to the other managers, to the people. Uh, um, uh, you, you, you're taken round, everyone says hello, you're shown things. You have, a, you have a moment when you stand at the coffee machine and hopefully your new colleagues will do all this kind of thing. And online you can't do that because you're just stuck at home. But what good uh, businesses have started to do is work around that and say things like, I tell you what, why don't you show us a corner of a picture in one of the rooms in your house and then we'll try and guess what the picture is and then you can tell us the you can tell us the 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 you know the story of the picture and where you got it and what it shows and why you like it or an object that's special to you and things like that now i've seen that done in classrooms face to face but it's amazing how online with those qualities i talked about the presence the attention the silence and so on that can be really powerful um, I mentioned this 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 uh, the, the, this this singer called Anne. Well, wouldn't you know it? She happens to be an ELT uh, person as well, um, uh, which, which is funny. And I, I first came across her as a, as a singer, and then I discovered she teaches. She does what I do. She teaches English um, uh, as a foreign or second language. Um, and she was teaching online the other day. It's just an example, uh, and and. She's got something called a shruti box, which is a bit like this thing, but it just goes and you can go and then you can sing above it and it creates a fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish it in about uh, 90 seconds uh, uh, and um, and it creates an amazing sound. And she did a thing with with her students online uh, and she had it hidden and she showed the shape. What do you think this is? Uh, and they didn't know. And then she pulled it out and said, what do you think this is? And still they didn't know. So she demonstrated what it was. And whoosh, they had this incredible conversation uh, um, for some time as a result of that, out of which she drew some issues to do with language and grammar and vocabulary and things like that. And then they did the same back. And apparently it was absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, there was a very good uh, uh, session uh, at the last online IATFL conference by a woman called Laura Edwards, who works in Dusseldorf in, 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 in Germany. And she described how they invited someone to be their guest for the students to interview, which is much easier to do online than it ever is to bring strangers uh, into the classroom, find strangers, and, and absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and the various stages that they went through using the chat box, using readings, using screens, sending invitations to the person they wanted to invite, preparing the questions, um, sending thank you letters, summarizing what went on. Fantastic and in some ways uh, more efficient and easier to do. Uh, and so finally, um, uh, and by the way, I know quite a lot of people are leaving uh, and I just wanted to say, uh, as I said, I've got about 30 seconds left that that um to to all of you who are leaving i i hope i repeat i hope no one who you love or like or know or anyone in the world has been affected by this dreadful pandemic and i hope that you continue to be healthy and well and your mothers and your fathers and your husbands and wives and sisters and brothers and nephews and nieces and kids you know because i we're going to get through this somehow well i hope we are Finally, last things. Um, let's go back into the classroom from all of this uh, online stuff and everything I've said. Uh, uh, five, five things, six things. Number one, students have lives. Uh, and, and it's our ability to somehow not be in their lives, but, 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 but to recognise that that really matters. Um, nurturing the student community really matters. The community of the class is, um, is as important as their grammar scores. It absolutely is. Authenticity is the key for the teacher. Uh, empathy and respect are its key companions. What we talk about really matters. Uh, and, and not, you know, I mean, I'm, I love grammar. Of course I do. I've spent my whole life working 
with how to teach it and what to think about it. But it's not important in the end. It's just not important. It's the what we talk about that matters. How we what we connect about that really matters. Uh, uh, the, the the next thing uh, because because uh, I've talked about this in the online world. Listen more and listen better. Find yourself in that silent silent uh, um, attention space and contact with individual students is really important and getting students to talk to each other and support each other private messages in chat boxes really really important I, i'm doing what so many uh, of us do as teachers and presenters rushing but it's time to stop now what i've tried to suggest in in a sort of big uh, uh, and over uh, a sort of general way um is is that like all of us uh, this situation we've been living through more serious or less serious depending on which country and community you're from uh, has, has, has helped me to do a lot of reflection and I've shared some of that with you um, who knows um, when and how it's all going to end we live in very strange times times of enormous sort of uh, conflict and stuff but what I've learned online and from watching the leaders around the world is that there are people who are wonderful at this, wonderful in this world. And it's them I draw inspiration from. So uh, I'm going to stop. I, I don't know whether we um, um five more minutes until the end of the session. OK, I've stopped. Uh, I've got to stop. If anyone wants to ask a question or say something, let's do that. Um, uh, um, Mark, yeah, I know. We, we, yes, there are lots of people in the world. Um, yeah, uh, anything anyone wants to say? Uh, I mean, some very nice messages, which I appreciate very much. Um, thank you. Um, uh, hello, Daniela. I've actually seen you. There you are. Um, yeah, I, uh, Daniela, the wonderful Daniela. Uh, by the way, I haven't seen her in person for a hundred years, and now it's going to be more difficult than ever because of all the stuff that's going on in our world. But as I say in Spanish, un día de estos, I hope so. Um, uh, um, uh, what, 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 what will be, will be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm sort of pretty much finished, but I'll just stick around for a few more minutes in case anyone wants to say anything. I, I love the thank yous, by the way, don't stop. <laughs> That's really good fun. Uh, um, um, well, I, I um, someone said, uh, uh, talked about the teaching community. I've lost it. Where is it? It's gone. Oh, yeah, uh, Paula uh, Aneki. Um, um, it's nice of you to say that about me, but I would turn that back. Uh, I repeat something I said earlier in this talk, which is some of the creativity and skills shown by uh, and, and love shown by teachers um, in this sudden conversion to online teaching has been inspiring or inspiring. Uh, and I, I, I want to salute you and them for the incredible way in which, in which, uh, you know, teachers have responded to this situation. Um, uh, yeah, and stay safe to you, Daniela, to all at Fisher, um, uh, and to all those teachers, uh, all of you and your families. Yeah, let's let let's stay safe and be all right. I want to be all right. That'd be so good. Um, I think it's probably time, don't you think, Clara, just to um, uh, close this thing down? Would you agree, Clara? I'm looking at, at uh, we, me and Clara have a little chat thing going. Uh, um, uh, right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish I was in um, Bucharest uh, or anywhere else in Romania. I, I had such a great time traveling around that beautiful country uh, from from down on the Danube Delta to up into um, um, Nekarachuk and everywhere else, places like that and stuff, just and Cluj and Yash and, and all these wonderful places. Um, I want to come back one of these days. But until then, uh, until then, um, I'm going. Is that all right? Uh, I'm going. Yes, I'm going. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I, by the way, I've really enjoyed looking at the um, 
some of the comments. And as you've heard, sometimes I've had a chance. Oh yes. Oh, I want to. I want to come to Brashov again, Christina. I'd love that. What a, oh, what a gorgeous place Brashov is. Yeah. Um, right. But this really is it. Uh, amazing. I'm going, ladies and gentlemen. Um, enjoy the rest of your conference. Uh, and I'm going to switch off my camera and say goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Here we go. Bye bye. Bye bye. Come on, computer. Wake up. Uh, yeah. Let's try this. No, it doesn't want it. Doesn't want to do it. Oh oh. I think I'm trying to go. It's not. It's not working. Uh, there we are. Uh, let's 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 go to this. <laughs>